Now we talked earlier about the role of hormone therapy either as an adjunct to treat this microscopic disease in patients who present with high grade disease, these Gleason's 8s, 9s and 10s. Scans look good but we know that they probably harbour disease that we can't see on scans and we're giving hormone therapy in combination with other treatments. What about patients who have had hormone therapy who already have disease very clearly demonstrated in the lymph nodes or in the bone on a CAT scan or bone scan and despite the hormone therapy that may in the beginning have been effective at controlling their disease, we're starting to see a rise in the PSA. So they're developing hormone resistant disease. What treatment options are there for those patients? Yeah, unfortunately we do see that. So, you know, we used to call that hormone independent disease and we've changed the nomenclature. We call that castrate resistant because we've taken their testosterone levels down to castrate levels and now they're castrate resistant. And the reason that we call it that is that even though they're not responding to the drug, whether it's Eligard or Lupron, we know that in the microenvironment, there are still very important, there's a lot of physiology going on, with what we call the androgen receptor. But luckily, there's some very important new drugs that have been, um, in the last five years, sort of almost uh, an embarrassment of riches, where we have all these new options for secondary ways of shutting down the androgen receptor. So drugs like abiraterone or enzalutamide, these are very important medications that would be used in that setting. And I think that it's probably worth making the point that this term castrate-resistant prostate cancer, when we give hormones, it puts the patient into a castrate state, doesn't it? it switches off the testosterone and in fact, in some countries even now where these hormone injections are very expensive, there are other ways, are there not, to bring down the testosterone level? Sure, I mean, you could do an orchiectomy, which is, you know, you remove the testicles and that'll get you to that level. Um, and, and that's something that used to be done in this country, although with the prevalence of these drugs, we do it less often. But I think, you know, you bring up a good point. We call it castrate and it is castrate, which means that there are a lot of metabolic effects. There could be weight gain, loss of muscle mass, loss of bone mineralization. So patients that are taking these medications, it's very important that we focus on the metabolic effects. Every one of my patients that are on these drugs, they have to exercise. We get DEXA scans. We have them come back. We measure their vitamin D and calcium because we have to aggressively manage them. The worst thing we can do is cure their prostate cancer and they end up breaking their hip because they had right. undiagnosed so osteoporosis. it's a quality of life issue as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I mean, I tell a lot of patients that prostate cancer, really, it's not necessarily a life-threatening disease anymore. It's more of a chronic disease. And many of these patients we see 20, 30 years out from diagnosis still doing extremely well. Sure. Some of the newer drugs that we've talked about already, the abiraterone, the Zytiga, these drugs were not available 10 years ago, and yet in the last five years plus, we've had FDA approval of at least five of these treatments for hormone-resistant, castrate-resistant disease. Any other drugs that would fall into that category? the Zytiga, the Abiraterone, these are oral medications Correct. that have been shown to be extremely efficacious at controlling disease. Anything else in that spectrum? Well, we have the Zofigo, which is a radium-223, and I have to say, it's really rewarding time to be managing these patients now because we've all had the experience where we've had patients, we get to know them very well over a 10-year period, they're doing great, they're on their androgen suppression and they feel great and they're living their lives. But once they became castrate resistant, there wasn't a whole lot that we had to offer them. And typically they would die within a year. That's very much changed now. These patients are doing extremely well now. And now we're struggling with, well, which drug do we give them first? Do we put them on the abiraterone, on the enzalutamide? Do we add the radium-223 as well? There are a lot of... And that's an infusion, yes. That's a, so the, the radium-223 is about a one minute infusion that you get once a month for six months. And so now we're trying to figure out how to layer on these different therapies, the layering of therapies, because some of them will work synergistically. So you don't want to just give one, stop it, and go to the next. You will you know, give one, then add another one on top of it. And we're, as clinicians, trying to figure out which drugs to choose and how to combine them. And some very fascinating studies that have been conducted right now to help us sort all that out. So we've talked about surgery, radiation, in and outside the prostate. We've talked about a whole collection of medications for this hormone resistant entity, as well as the role of hormones prior to that. Does that mean chemotherapy is off the cards now, or do we still give patients 
chemotherapy for prostate well, cancer. Chemotherapy is a very important part of this. There was a very important study that showed that for patients that had cancer resistant disease or even if they had they were responding to the hormone therapy, if they had metastatic disease, that chemotherapy is very important and really added quite a bit to survival. And again, you've got to sort out who should get chemotherapy early on. I think it's fair to say someone that presents with bulky lymph nodes or visceral involvement, lung, liver, those patients probably should get steered towards chemotherapy because they're going to have the greatest benefit from it.